message is a part of the series on the Olivet Discourse, and uh, our videographer was not here on the particular Sunday that we uh, did this message, and so this is sort of a redo for your sake. So let me pray, and uh, we'll share these things from Matthew 24, 15. The title of the message is, The Man Who Wants to Be God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your word and uh, the Lord Jesus and the truth that he brings to us uh, in Matthew 24, 15. Pray God that you help me to present it clearly and for each one who hears these words to be uh, well taught by the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, Jesus, on the summit of the Mount of Olives, uh, sort of walking away from Jerusalem toward their bed and breakfast in Bethany, as we've said before, is explaining to his disciples the great destruction that is going to befall Jerusalem. His disciples have asked him, what are the signs uh, that this is about to happen and when will this happen? And Jesus is in the process of describing the different signs that will take place that indicate that, that uh, this great cataclysmic destruction uh, is uh, about to occur. And so uh, these, so far, the six signs that he has mentioned are these. The rise of many messianic impostors, a third world war, famines and natural disasters, the persecution, great persecution of the people of God, gods of people turning their back on Jesus, and the gospel being broadcast into all the world. So when we look at these things, all six of these things that I just read are a little bit fuzzy. They, they feel like trends, really. Take earthquakes, for example. You know, I read that and I want to ask, well, is... And we'll say that an earthquake takes place, like the one in Japan. And you say, well, is that the earthquake that indicates that his coming is uh, near? Um, is, is there a particular earthquake that would enable me to say that because of that earthquake, uh, I know the end is near? And, and the answer to all of these things, whether it's persecution or the rise of false messiahs and so on, it's all a little bit fuzzy really. But all of this uncertainty is about to go away. In verse 15 of Matthew 24, Jesus talks about something that people will be able to pin down right to the very day. You could get out your calendar, take a page, and circle the square with the date on it. Uh, and say, that when this happens, I know for sure that, that the coming is uh, on schedule. So Jesus, in verse 15, uh, refers to an event that he calls an abomination. So let me read the verse. He says, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. So uh, he calls this thing an abomination, and he tells us that Daniel is actually the person who lays all this out. Daniel is the, in the Old Testament, there's uh, Psalms sort of lands about in the middle of the Old Testament, and then following the Psalms, there's a few other poetical books like Proverbs and Song of Solomon. And then we get to the uh, prophets. There's the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, uh, excuse me, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel is the last of the four major prophets, and then there's 12 smaller, minor prophets. And so Daniel, Jesus says, is the one that lays this all out. And Jesus assumes that the disciples know the details from Daniel, and that the reason he mentions it is because when what Daniel talks about happens, it will be the sign that the Jews had better run for their lives. And he starts talking about that in verse 16, and we'll, we'll deal with that next week. So what I'd like you to do is turn to Daniel chapter 9. So I'm going to do that as well. Daniel chapter 9. 
And uh, we need to see what there is to know here. So remember, back in August, we said that the events that Jesus is describing here in Matthew 24 fit into the framework of the 77s. And Daniel describes these 77s in, uh, later on in chapter 9. We'll read it in just a moment. So Daniel tells us that after 69 of these sevens, and each seven is a, like a series of seven years, after 69 of these seven-year periods, the Messiah will be cut off, he says, and that leaves one more seven-year period. And it seems that this last, in this last seven-year stretch of years, is when a great king brokers a treaty between Israel and its surrounding enemies. So let, let me read, uh, starting in verse 25. No one understand this, Daniel says, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. Now the anointed one in Hebrew, that word is Mashiach, and we kind of turn that into an English word, Messiah. And so Daniel's talking about the coming of the Messiah. He says there will be uh, seven sevens and 62 sevens when the anointed one comes. And uh, so that adds up to what? 62 and 7 is 69 sevens. And there's 70 all together. So that's all the seven year periods but one. So he says, uh, the city will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one, that's Jesus, will be cut off and will have nothing. I believe he's talking about the, the time when Jesus was crucified. Uh, the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's when the Romans came and sacked and leveled Jerusalem. The end will come like a flood. War will continue till the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant or a treaty. Covenant, treaty, same word. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. But in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And in a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. And so this is, uh, this is a lot of information here. What, what Daniel is saying in the last verse in Daniel chapter 9 is that in the halfway point of, the, of this last seven-year period, uh, it, this seven-year period will be begun by a treaty, and halfway through... The, the king who caused the treaty to come into being will, will break the treaty and he will uh, take over the Temple Mount and he will set up an image of himself or he will, he will set up something bad in the, on the wing of the temple and this bad something is called an abomination and it causes desolation. So, and then he goes on to say that this terrible condition will last until the end. And so the end, I think, is the end of the seven-year period. So it tells me that there will be this terrible thing in the wing of the temple for three and a half years, the second half. So Daniel has more to say about this in some later chapters. And so I want to uh, invite you to turn to Daniel 11, 11, uh, 36 and 37. Uh, we're going we're gonna to see here that, that um, his, uh, excuse me, Daniel eleven thirty one, 31. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. So this tells us that this king, this treaty-making powerful person, will use his military might to invade the Temple Mount, and then he will do his will uh, because his strong military will allow him to do that. There's a couple verses that follow in Daniel 11 
that, that shed a little more light yet. I'm going to read verse 36 and verse 37. This king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women. I think that's Jesus. Nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. So... Um, this passage is describing how um, there's more going on here than just stopping the, the sacrifices. It, it tells us that, that he isn't just interested in opposing God. He is actually um, trying to be the one who is worshipped himself. That's why it's called the message, the one who wants to be God. So let me go uh, one step further in Daniel 12. He mentions the abomination that causes desolation three times, Daniel does. So this is 11 and 12, chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. So the, the book of Revelation covers the same ground, and it talks about these days uh, similar to Daniel. In Revelation 13, verses 5 and 6, I read this. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. Now, 42 months is the same as 1,260 days. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. So that is the same thing that Daniel says in Daniel 11, 36 and 37, which we just read. Now, 42 months is the same as three and a half years. That's the second half of the seven-year tribulation period. And that is the same as 1,260 days. It happens that in the book of Revelation, it talks about 1,290 days and then 1,335 days. And so that's, if I, I'm doing my math right, that's an additional 30-day period and then another 45-day period after that. And it doesn't tell us what those periods are. If you would allow me to speculate, I would speculate that, the, that after the three and a half years are over, the first 30-day period is when Jesus Christ is doing sort of a mopping up operation and, and eliminating all the pockets of resistance and uh, the Antichrist is defeated, certainly, uh, but there's other little areas where uh, his will is still being resisted. So it takes 30 days to go throughout all of planet Earth and eliminate all the opposition. And I, uh, I'm guessing that the next 45-day period is the time that it takes Jesus to delegate authority to his followers and set up his earthly kingdom, maybe do some rebuilding, uh, and so on. So in order to firmly establish this in your thinking, I would like to uh, offer to you the Apostle Paul's detailed description of the same period of time. So we find this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So now we're, now we're in the New Testament again. Here's what Paul says. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. So there were some people that had received a report that Jesus had come and they had missed it. And that seems to have been in the form of a, a uh, forged letter of Paul. And Paul said, I didn't write the letter. Let me remind you again how this all takes place. So he says, 
Don't let anyone deceive you in, the, in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And then he adds, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things. And so Paul does not use the word abomination that causes desolation, but what he is describing is exactly the same thing that Daniel is talking about over in Daniel 11, 9, 11, and 12, and what uh, uh, the book of Revelation is talking about in the first part of chapter 13. So this all fits together, and it is true, my friends. So we're, we'll uh, sort of take this ball and run with it a little farther next week. But I want to stop right here and, and talk about what we have been doing at the end of each of these messages. And that is the end time attitude. Jesus teaches that the end is coming and what it will be like so that we, not, not just so that we can say, oh boy, now I know what the end is going to be like. It's, 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 a, it's not just for information's sake. It is also so that we will live different now. Knowing what's coming, we live differently now. And so we've looked at a little bit of a different angle of, of what it is that we're to know now. Um, and this one uh, has to do with, with the this whole business of Antichrist coming and wanting to be God. I think that verse 15 in Matthew 24 may just be the key verse of the entire passage. It shows us that, that it's not really about religious confusion or wars or famine or persecution. It is about trying to kick God off his throne and take his place. Now, the spirit that is at work here sounds suspiciously to me like the devil at work. I'd like us to think about how hard he tried back in the Garden of Eden to, to cause Eve to doubt God and to put her confidence instead in what he told her. He lied, by the way. He lied. Recall that the devil said to Jesus, in the book of Matthew, chapter 4. I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will bow down and worship me, the devil said. You remember that in the beginning when the devil rebelled from God himself, he said, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. And then Isaiah adds sort of a comment from God. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit, you devil. So if, if this is the attitude of the devil, then it's no wonder that he, that when he fills the Antichrist, that Antichrist wants to set himself up as God. The spirit of Antichrist stubbornly refuses to give Jesus Christ and God the Father their rightful place. And dear ones, that spirit is with us even now. What I see is that the closer we get to the end, everything gets stripped away, and this is the only issue that is left. Who is going to be God? Whose will will be done? God's will or man's will? And the closer we get to the time of the end, 
the resistance to the headship of Christ becomes more blatant. Now, obviously, we're here on Sunday morning, and uh, we are not openly resisting the rule of Jesus Christ. When we've sung songs. I didn't hear any resistance to Jesus Christ in the music that we sang. And uh, you were paying reasonably close attention, and no one's here standing, shaking their fist. And uh, so I don't see any open resistance. But what we do, dear ones, is we get a little more sneaky than that. And what we do, we, we, we have learned to move God off his throne in a couple different ways. And I'd like to talk about two ways. One is reject, and the other is redefine. By reject, I mean that we say that Jesus is Lord, but then when it comes right down to it, we refuse to let God have his way. He may tell us to forgive, and we refuse to do it. We understand his call for sexual purity, but we refuse to live that way. We know that the truth is precious to him and that we are commanded not to lie, but we lie again and again. We understand that because God is good, his will trumps everything else, but then we go on as though God is for some reason unreasonable for wanting what he wants. Or we use our fiery temper to make sure that our will is done, not his. Do you see that as we move toward the time when the Antichrist becomes more openly resistant to God and he takes off his mask and openly challenges God's right to rule, that the spirit of rebellion becomes the spirit of this age. This means that the closer we get to the last days, the more care we must, make, we must take to make sure that we aren't caught up in the spirit, the spirit of resistance against the will of God. Be intentional. Let the goal of your life be to become comfortable with the loving rule of Jesus Christ over you. I'm preaching to myself too. Because the spirit of the age, as it rises, will be to resist Jesus Christ and his will. So I gave you two words. One is reject. We just talked about that. The other is redefine. In the end, redefine has the same goal as reject. It just is a little more sneaky. We know that Jesus is great. I'm giving you an example now. Jesus is great. He created the universe out of nothing. He is before time and knows all things. He is the eternally existent, before time, member of the Godhead. And it is just plain crazy to challenge him or pull away from him and try to live our lives separate from him. As though we knew better than him. So what we do is we make him into a smaller God. Perhaps we begin to think of him as less than good. Or maybe weak in some way. Or uninvolved or distracted. Another strategy is to assign God a lesser IQ. Allowing us to think that, at least in our case at the moment, God is mistaken. Sometimes the notion that God has forgotten. Or maybe he's not as holy as the preacher says he is. So that, so that maybe he's not as concerned about sin as what we thought he was. I could go on. We redefine who he is and then we shove him aside and assert ourselves. We are also quite clever at redefining what it is that he wants. Some say, I believe in God, as though somehow our knowing that there is a God is, is, is redemptive. 
that God is in heaven hugging himself when we say that thing, oh, I'm so relieved. Pastor Mark believes in me. James the Apostle shoots that idea down in flames when he says, hey, the devil believes in God. There's nothing redemptive about that. That's not what God's after. The Baptist version of this is to believe the right things about ourselves in Jesus. We agree with God that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and we agree that Jesus died on the cross to pay our sin debt. All of that is true, and I celebrate that, and so then we call ourselves believers. But having believed these things, we can be just as determined to push God off his throne as the Antichrist himself. What I want us to see, remember the title, The Man Who Wants to Be God? What I want us to see, that at least in one sense, the man who wants to be God is us. So when Jesus comes, the main thing that will happen will be the undoing of everything that is opposed to his will. To be prepared for his coming means that we become absolutely ruthless toward the spirit of Antichrist in us. The pride and the willfulness and the determination to have our own way. To put it positively, it means that we be determined that we be as comfortable with his rule over us as possible in every aspect of our lives. Over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter says, In your hearts, and that is the same as your will, your heart and your will, same thing. He says, On the level of your will, set apart Christ as Lord. And that's what I'm asking for here today. Now I'd like to close the, this mess this message by, by asking us to say together the Lord's Prayer. Now, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer, but we're not going to forget what we've already said about the spirit of Antichrist. And I think that it's going to be amazing to you as you say the words. And so, say the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Pray with me, would you? Lord Jesus, we thank you for uh, your promised coming. And right now, we cast down every imagination, every thought that exalts itself against you. Lord, teach us your way. Lord, whatever is in us that is uh, in open resistance to you, we, we uh, take measures to uh, eliminate that out of our lives.